if something is in Scripture, in the Bible, uh, it's there because the writers felt it was necessary to add it, either for right. because of directly who were they spe- who they were speaking to, and as it turns out over the over the centuries, it's also for our benefit. The general rule in interpreting Scripture, especially for scholars, even if the scholars never intend doing anything with this reality, is that the the common assumption is nothing's there by accident. They might read something and say, oh, that's contextual to the day, that's fine, but it's got no meaning for me. Now, okay, we can analyze that, we can we can look at that and say, let's use an extreme example of <clears throat> where Jesus says, don't go to the Gentiles, because he says that in part of the gospel. Now, if you take it directly, as in today, Paul says, oh my God, the gospel's not for me. But that doesn't make sense, because later Jesus says, so what What do I do now? I feel a bit insecure about that, because it doesn't sound like the Jesus I've come to know. Yeah. So what, what am I meant to do with this? Am I missing something? Okay. So that's where you should start. And then you say, okay, well, if I look at this, to be fair, when I read Matthew 1, it does say Jesus was coming to save his own people from their sins. So, okay, mm-hmm. this must be linked somehow then. Then I look at it further and I'm like, well, if the covenant is with Israel, then maybe in that moment this doesn't, this isn't actually offensive. This is just the process playing out. But then I look at it and I'm like, okay, wait, wait, wait. Is it possible that not everything in the Gospels equally applies to me in the moment it was said or in the way it was said? Yeah. But at the same time, when all things come together, I'm no less able to be a recipient of the good news, even as a Gentile. I've got a piece of amazing fudge here that my wife made last night. Now, I love the fudge. I can't wait to clean the bowl out, which is why later today I've had so much I might be doing cartwheels with all the energy. But imagine if I interrupted her while she's busy mixing the ingredients. And I'm like, oh, I just can't wait. I need to have mm. something now. And she's like, mm, no, you don't want it now because it's not going to taste good yet. What happens is that subconsciously people realize that there's portions that look dangerous and even scary when they read the Gospels. And yeah. what they learn to do is they learn to actually just shut it off. They right. learn to actually ignore it to the point that they've read the Gospels, they've read Acts, they've read all of that. But they've so conditioned themselves out of fear, insecurity, not understanding or misunderstanding, oversimplifying the gospel as being about the cross, that these other portions that don't fit that narrative become incon- inconsequential and even offensive, possibly. Sure. Without like intention. Like the whole thing about when Paul talks about women, right? He says, women must remain silent in the churches. I yes. forbid a woman to speak. And then he says, uh, you know, let them ask their husbands at home. And it, it sounds like what he's doing is being sexist and, and misogynist and saying, just shut up. Right. And, you know, and, 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 and unless what... you understand that in relation to all the other things that they say, and, and in the culture and context of the time, and in terms of what is the principle we extract from that, not necessarily the tactics, right? That's what I've learned to do. Right. Uh, then, yeah, you, it's like it's one of these segments of scripture that seems like it's kind of uh, unique to that time, but we can disregard it because if we said that in church today, you know, we'd have a <laughs> we'd have an uproar and everybody would leave and the media would come and you know we'd be publicly shamed and all that sort of. Thing.